May the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart, be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Most of you know that the very last book of the Bible is the book of Revelation. It's filled with many images of prophecies of the final days. And it can be a scary book because it does foretell disaster upon calamity at the end of time, at the end of history. It speaks of wars, and rumors of wars, the coming of the Antichrist, and untold suffering. You know, sometimes I wonder if history itself is not simply a recitation of wars, political strife, tragedies, and the natural disasters that we humans have suffered throughout recorded history, and even in our present day. For those of us who live relatively safe and mundane lives, it's hard to imagine what it must have been like for a person being bombed in London during the Blitz, or more recently in Mariupol, in the Ukraine, shell after shell flattening the city, any one of which might explode in the midst of a small group huddled in an already crumbling house or in a subway tunnel. Then there is our most recent tragedy. How can we even begin to understand what it must have been like for the elementary school children in Uvalde, Texas? All the details are not known, but this much I do know. The experience of that horror must mark the psyches of the survivors for the rest of their lives. Many, even now, are experiencing the senseless loss of their children or their grandchildren, their siblings or friends. For those living in that community, it must seem like the loss of a whole generation. And for we who are not there, we are just reading about it, hearing reports of it on television, radio, in the newspaper, and in podcasts. Yet we feel compassion for those who were there. We feel with the parents, we feel with the teachers and staff, and we think, oh, that someone could perpetrate such a crime. It fills us with rage, with consternation, with horror, with hollowness, and ultimately, with sadness. History is replete with such stories of man's inhumanity to man, perpetrated by individuals or groups. We could list hundreds of incidents from the Holocaust to the crimes of Vlad the Impaler to the acts of the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia that led to the deaths of perhaps three million people. Each one is an horrific example of the atrocity of which we humans are capable. I am convinced that such tragedy, such wanton action, is made possible primarily by our capacity to view people as objects rather than as brothers and sisters in our human family. When we can think of someone else as a cog in a machine, when we can think of others simply as stepping stones, or votes, or as expendable soldiers, or as some other means to our own personal, ideological, or political ends, then we come to have a capacity to harm them. A killer has a capacity to kill because he or she puts their own personal needs, no matter how small, above the life, above the needs, above the feelings of someone else. The other becomes an object. This inability to see others as human, as God's fellow creatures, is what sin is truly all about. This is surely why Jesus told us to treat others as we would wish to be treated. It is the fundamental basis of the last five commandments. I sat down to write this sermon with the idea of talking about the tree of life. 
as it appears in our reading from the book of Revelation. And it seems I've wandered pretty far from that text. And yet, I think there is a connection. In verse 12, Jesus tells John of Patmos, look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me and I will give to each person according to what they have done. This giving to each person is something that will happen on Judgment Day. And when Jesus speaks this judgment, he is speaking of it in the moral sense, not in the sense of how much we could aggrandize ourselves in the here and now, but how we have treated others in the here and now. It's just my opinion. I cannot speak for God or for Jesus but I believe that there is punishment in the afterlife for those who commit terrible crimes. I do not believe that people such as the shooter in Texas or Pol Pot or those in the evil Nazi regime will find their way to heaven. And yet, verse 14, Jesus says, blessed are those who wash their robes that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. He's talking about the city of God here. Even horrific crimes can be forgiven. Maybe, maybe if an individual is truly contrite. Maybe if they exhibit remorse and deep down inside come to understand the magnitude of what they have done then, perhaps that person might be forgiven. Even so, I am not sure that anyone capable of such crimes as I have enumerated would be also capable of true repentance. But that is the human in me talking. My desire to see good avenge evil comes to the surface in my musings. In my heart of hearts, I wish to see revenge done upon those who have done evil. And it is a difficult impulse to rationalize away. However, none of us can fully comprehend the mercy of our God. God, God is merciful. And it is our hope that when we are judged on that final day of history, that Jesus will delve deeply into our hearts and minds and souls, and we'll see that though we have sinned, though we have been thoughtless, and though we have occasionally looked on others as objects rather than as sisters and brothers, fellow human beings with emotions and sensory feelings, that we are remorseful for our sins, that we are redeemable. I hope Jesus reaches inside and looks at us and finds those things. It is our hope that Jesus will see that our robes are clean because they have been washed, washed in the blood of the Lamb. So we find out from Revelation chapter 7, verse 14. And so it is that we come to the tree, the tree of life. This is an interesting place to be at the end of the Bible, very near the end of the book of Revelation, because the first book of the Bible speaks of this selfsame tree. The tree is planted in the garden by God. In Genesis, when Adam and Eve are kicked out of the garden, is because they might eat of this tree. I think this shows that it was always God intent that we live forever without sin with our holy triune God. God offered humanity everlasting life, but through sin, all manner of sin, treating others as objects, it became impossible. It would only become possible again to walk with God if we ceased sinning and all of our past sins are washed away. 
Of course, this can only happen one way for we Christians, and that is through Christ. This is what that reference about being washed in the blood of the Lamb is all about. So God's intention made known in the very beginning of the Bible. In the word is not fulfilled until we come to the very end of the Bible. The tree is in the place where God walks in the beginning, in the garden. In the end of Revelation, the tree is where God resides in the holy city. So in the end, eternal life comes when and where we are with God. So all this time between the Garden of Eden and the end of Revelation is a journey for us. We move from a point of total innocence at the creation through history, which seems to be one human-made calamity after another, and then finally to find peace again peace in the Lord, to then partake of what? To finally partake of the tree of life. It is my hope that all of those who have suffered at the hands of evil, who have suffered through calamity and injustice, will taste of that tree, will experience the peace that God brings. This is a comforting thought that in the end, humanity will again be with God. But what about the here and now? What about now? What about these calamities that we just keep continuing to experience? Many theologians identify the tree of life as representative of Christ himself. Some would say that when we eat of the bread and drink of the cup, we are partaking of the tree of life at that very moment. This is one way that we cope. We become one in the body of Christ, living with and for each other, no longer seeing other people as objects, not even as separate human beings, but of one body. We don't chop off our own hands. We don't harm ourselves, do we? When we see the other as ourselves, then a lot of this terrible, these terrible things that are perpetrated on humanity will begin to cease. This means on the most basic level, we must live the best lives that we can. Treating others, no matter their political persuasion, no matter their race or color or creed, we treat them with respect and love. All of us are God's children. When you have thought, have a thought that objectifies another person, my friends, that is a sin, and we have seen where that can lead to. So we wash our robes in the blood of the Lamb. We are forgiven for that sin. This certainly makes our personal lives better since we go forward with at least the intention to sin no more. I think it's important to recognize that when ho horrors do happen in the world, that we should feel sorrow, we should feel pain and bitterness because lives destroyed past and present and future are all connected to our own but we should not allow the pain and sorrow to debilitate us. Rather, it should motivate us to work to make the world a better place, a place where the horrors become more and more rare until they disappear altogether. And so we take the path moving forward. For we Christians, this is marked by God's word. I believe this path is one that does make for better lives for us in the here and now and promises us an eternal life with God. The word sets us on a path, a path that leads toward the tree of life, ever closer to God our Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen.